everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm excited about today's reading. We have two legendary poets with us today, Jack Hirschman and Michael C. Ford. Jack will read first and then Michael. Jack Hirschman, born in 1933 in New York, the Bronx, Emeritus Poet Laureate of San Francisco, 2008-2009, member Communist Labor Party, 1980-1992, National Organizing Committee, 1992-1994, League of Revolutionaries for a New America, LRNA, 1994 to present, founding member of the Revolutionary Poets Brigade, 2009 to present, recently assumed helm of the Coordinating Committee of the World Poetry Movement, WPM, centered in Medellin, Colombia. His books and chapbooks number more than 100. His masterworks are 3,000 page books called The Arcanes, published in Salerno, Italy, in the American language. The fourth volume will be published there later this year. In 1968, I read Arto Anthology, edited by Jack Hirschman with some of Jack's translations while sitting at the counter of Zuki's in Santa Monica at 2 p.m. <laughs> that year, I also read Hirschman's Black Alus, which I love and which is one of my top five books. In Jerusalem, Jack wrote, quote, the war is over. Jerusalem has sprung me from the terrible nuts. I begin to see out of others' eyes the real old feeling, the needs I call Jerusalem. And when I said Buddha, I smiled Jerusalem. And where I dream revolution, I lean toward Jerusalem. Back to the word, the shared word between us of all the colors in the slow, mad, clear silence of her day, end of quote. Hirschman's lyrical love, camaraderie, compassion, and Kabbalah lot bop lift up our hearts. A radiant camarado, camarado, and one of the most magnificent poets of the whole epic, Jack Hirschman. Hi. You want me to begin now, Harry? Please begin, Mr. Hirschman. <laughs> okay. It's lovely to be with you all, and uh, I'm going to start with uh, uh, my first poem is the poem uh, that I wrote uh, uh, for the, uh, the capital of capitalism. New York, New York. It's big. It's ugly. I hate it. I love it. I'm free. Oh, talk to me. Can't you hear me? I can't leave it. I'll do anything for it. It's so big. It's filthy. It's so sweet. I adore it. I'm staying. I'll never leave. It's in me. It's so cruel. I hate it. I love it. It's mine. I own it. It's mine. Again and again, I say, I hate war. I love it. It's disgusting. It's awesome. I love it. I won't go. I promise. It's beautiful. Talk to me. Can't you hear me loving? Oh, it's so brutal. It's so shit. Talk to me. Tell me what I should do. Anything. It's marvelous. I'll never stop loving it. Never, never, never. Never, never. Now I'd like to read Mother. We are not in this world. A long time ago it happened, it was over. The world, the war, the world war. I took you by the hand through it. Tiniest hand, tiniest star. You didn't move. Then I was dead. Then you were dead. In the open mouth of grief, there is a candle. I am not with my breath. I am the slow peeling away of the skin and all that all the deaths I've seen register in my eyes. I have been a laughing tree beside a stove of honeyed bananas. I've been a silver fox 
and the elegance of heels. I have been what has brought you down and the words you look up. I have been the spit upon and the ganged, the slain and the invincible, the bitch of moons, the whiplash of compassion behind the drug of sluts, the red thread that liberates all convicts, the thimble that balances your jiggers, the kalimba that wraps your nightmares in lullabies, the power of birth when a child dies. We are not in this world. A long time ago it happened, it was over the world, the war, the world war. I took you by the hand through it. Tiniest hand, tiniest star. Why should I weep now, now that you've ended the darkness? Many like me are around you. Our ether is without end. Should we never speak again, you shall write our conversation. Should my voice fall short of your heart, but that is impossible. You're still such a child. I'm weeping at the window. Other voices will lift mine and carry it to the center of your breathing. Oh, my beloved, when you burst into flames, when your bones were blistered, at those precise moments, who drove the seeds in a rapid torrent of thighs and targeted the yearning eggs with glory? When you grew like a primer into a text of rage at all the injustice of this profiteering hell, when your mind was broken, when your sex was split like Korea, Vietnam, like the North and South, when poisons came with pleasure and the antidote was dead. Who cut through the air as if wringing a chicken's neck? Who who tore the feathers and flung them to cushion your fall? I am the creature who runs through the streets screaming your name against the mockery. I am the sleep of the suicide and the cataract of immemorial hair. I am the attack of liberty on the heart of heart and the poem on the heart of hearing, the solitude, the grace, the smile that returns your smile from the depths of the biology of a labor and joy, only the heartbeats of the dithyram approach, only the soul thrums of the cosmos define. We are not in this world. A long time ago it happened, it was over. The world, the war, the world war. I took you by the hand through it, tiniest hand, Tiniest star. Now, I would like, I would like to read. Uh, since I lived in Los Angeles, and my beloved son David died in Los Angeles uh, at twenty-five, I'm going to read the arcane that I wrote for David. It's called the David Arcane. It's an elegy on the death of David Hirschman, photographer, musician, and poet, taken by leukemia and lymphoma at 25, March 22nd, 1982. Okay, one. Sirini Tavaric, my first words to you, life after death, 
in the thicket of mourning, in the plasma of this blood of the poem, which couldn't suffice. Silini Tavaric, winsome little man of music, brother of my jazz, street heart where all sounds are harbored. So no more time. So no more time. So no more time for hospitals. No more time in this land, which never was ours. Still in need the varage. Light of this afterlife. This riff whose bones are tears and whose spirit still soars too. The way through this is through me. I'm not afraid or ashamed. The clouds are my friends. They are my friends on earth who float about the sky, tremendous doves. Your hair is still shining. Glow in us past the embers. We have this in inward task now. It is recognized by the glistening grief transformed into beatitude. I touch my brother and it means, brother, you live. I kiss you and you fly to my need. In a flash, we are inside the sisters. The sisters are the insides of our vowels. Our voices soar as we pronounce our simple Rest together. Yes, I rest in peace with you. This morning is our bliss. I kiss you a thousand sparks. I mean, the sex of the asphodel turns toward you. I mean, your smile is embedded in my eyes. This is my gentle breeze brother of your gentle ways. I found hope with you when I was hopeless. I trusted you in a world spellbound with deception. My grief is my way of saying the water is as clear as the world we struggle for to be. Comrade Death, Comfort me with your life. Our songs are sweet. Our music already renowned among the flowers and the anthems of the butterflies. Our brothers know how to make light. That is no mean teaching. Our sisters know how to etherize a body as if bread were forever soul. Your journey, my journey, your kiss of flame shall warm our path to the galaxy and us together take root in the elements mixed with your brave fragility, the touch of dark laughter by which we recognize space and be at last the mercy in each other adored. Iskra. Я пишу это слово. Ти, Ленин, сам прорастешь.
kwestia wymogu człowieka, który zna historię rewolucji etromir. Spark, when I write that word, you, Lenin himself, is transformed into a young man who knows the story of the revolution of this world. Please don't be afraid if you are a blade of grass or a wave or a tree. I will sit beside you. It is the way it is, the way we be. Three. Light passes through me when I see your face within. This is a small poem, an all poem. No more morning, all dawn. David was a poet. His was the first book of poems printed in America. Streets of joy and happy light poems as they happen or are brought to the tables of comrades and friends, a sunlight all the moon long, our clarity together. What he brought caught in his photograph of Bobby Hutcherson was the delicate sensitivity of a face changing as the hands played the vibes, changing because the sound is a way of saying jazz is so like himself. Hi, what's up? Oh, much there is to continue playing and hearing the chords and sweet time jazz birthing over and over in this sweet heart of sound, I see the plane trees, the song of the butterflies. I can go on dying forever. The moon is in my hand. Teper kakslava sama jasnos nasha boedigo za rabotu budushego vesvobodu now, like the glory itself, our clarity together for the work of the future, for liberty as ever, your comrade. And now I, I would like to read the uh, is it there's time for me to read uh, what time how much more time eight more do I have? minutes jack eight more minutes eight more minutes all right let me read uh, maybe a couple of other arcanes is what i have okay i'll read one that i just uh, finished writing most recent or among the most recent for the death of lawrence ferlinghetti who was a dear friend of mine and uh, it's called The Elegy Arcane, in memory of Lawrence Ferlinghetti for Elaine Katzenberger, who is the director of City Lights Books. Adio, Lawrence, for works well done, for the poems and paintings and the stands taken for causes in need of spreading the word, you, Papa, list, anarchist, common nest for red birds and black to fly into and out of. You've long been honored, and now that you belong to what ages are left in this holocaustic pandemic for us all, we know that your passing has left the world angelically filled with the light of all you've been, a fighter but reticent, 
a righteous warrior, but gentle of spirit. That's why the night of the day you died, I was embraced by an angel who loved you so much, she kept you breathing by way of her own breathlessness and is now transfigured in the modesty she's brought to you, who first brought it to her, who can now show the world the glory of the book we all know, despite burial or cremation, or any number of ways your death is described, the book, which is opened at the cover, and into whose depths you are lain, not to be buried at all, but to be read and read and read. And now I'd like to read uh, an older one, but one will tell you a lot of where I've been since I left, <laughs> since I left Los Angeles some 58 years ago. <laughs> this is called The Praise Song for the International Brigades Arcane. One. Accent on international against the global only that never arrives at the hungry mouths of the world. Accent on the international brigades that are still the deathless moment human beings became conscious. Accent on Abraham Lincoln Brigade, which is always belong to the heart of and for all lovers of liberty, which has never stopped bringing supplies, medicines to the lines of struggle against fascism in whatever form, with an ageless energy that redounds to the original hope that defies the advocates of coalitions of a loan, bringing collectivity into the 21st century, inspiring brigadistas everywhere on hillsides, on cultural fronts to continue the struggle humanity can never lose. For example, I'll be meeting tonight with the Revolutionary Poets Brigade. Two, the brigade exists because you fought in Spain, Nate Thornton, in 1983, Alejandro Murguia and others organized, organized poets, artists, writers, intellectuals, and translators into the Roque Dalton Cultural Brigade, named <clears throat> after the great El Salvadorian poet. That brigade existed because you fought in Spain, Nate Thornton. A year later, Haitian poet Boadiba in Oakland, Paul Rock in New York, and I formed the Jacques Rumen Cultural Brigade, named after the poet and novelist who was the youngest founder of a communist party in the 20th century, the Communist Party of Haiti, which, which not only existed because you thought they have met when Jacques visited Spain and the brigades itself during the Civil War. Such resonances of engagement of the 20th century and now 21st century brigadiers of justice and light who cherish the vision of a world transformed as part of the 95th birthday acclamation for you, Nate Thornton, who know very well that that vision will never die, beaten, chained, slandered. Look, it's reaching for your voice. Lift it, 
Let it rise in its place. The international shall be the human race. Thank you, Jack. I love your poetry. You are one of the most vibrant, vibrant poets I've ever met in my life. You know, uh, Truffaut said that Artaud was the most vibrant actor of his generation. And you're right up there with him. And I love your poem about your mother, about New York City, the elegy for your son, David, the elegy on Berlinghetti, your friend, and also your sense of hope for all of the proletariat in the world with your last poem about the International Brigade. But you have honored us today with your poetry, and we are deeply grateful to you for that. And uh, just keep blazing away. You know, I haven't seen you for a long time in person, but I saw you read. <laughs> I saw you read yeah, at Beyond yeah. Baroque. I saw you read at the Venice Jail. I saw you read at Gasoline Alley in uh, L.A. And uh, I've always loved your poetry. So thank you, Jack Hirschman from San Francisco. Thank you. Thank and now we're going to introduce Michael C. Ford. Michael C. Ford's first CD, entitled Fire Escapes, was a 1995 entry from New Alliance Records and Tapes. Henhouse Studios has been promoting and marketing his CD, Look Each Other in the Years, 2014. That document, both vinyl and CD, features a stellar band of musicians, not the least of which were surviving members of a 1960s theater rock quartet that most of you may recall as The Doors. His debut 12-inch vinyl recording, Language Commando, earned a Grammy nomination on the first ballot in 1986, and his book of selected work, Emergency Exits, earned initial nomination for the Pulitzer for Poetry in 1998. Populated Wilderness is being published in a 2021 chapbook format as a fundraiser for Lockwood Animal Rescue Foundation. I first met Michael C. Ford circa 1970 when he was hosting a benefit for Kenneth Patchen at the Peace and Freedom Hall on West Washington in Venice. Ford writes about jazz, baseball, his journeys across America, injustice. He has a special place in his heart for film actresses, including Janet Lee in a landscape entitled Janet Lee. Quote, who somehow gives her character voices the edge of a rearrangement of phlox blossoms in sweet, unassailable zones. We knew all along she'd consider ways to stay in Stockton, even if it's just returning, waving with her always summer hair, looking at us with eyes like liquid winter. And this is just to say we love her in our ambivalent sky for a star refusing to explode, she comes back to glimmer. That's an elegiac, loving poem to Janet Lee. Michael C. Ford's poetry is eloquent and transformative. Here's a brilliant poet, Michael C. Ford. Well, this is Zoom thing isn't working for me, and, and uh, that's why uh, you're only getting audio. If the audio cuts out, please let me know. Um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an electronic, I'm electronically retarded anyway, so I have trouble pushing a button on a doorbell, you know, so um, uh, bear with me, and uh, uh, it was just great. Jack, are you still there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, How are you, Mike? Uh, you, you know, it's, it's been a little while between visits, my brother. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully uh, someday soon. Um uh, this is the way it's going to work, gang. Uh, I'm I'm going to uh, uh, read um, some. Uh, I'm going to read from five volumes of um, oh, just pages, a page from each of five volumes of my published work, and um, I feel like I'm doing a Claude Rains imitation. You know, Claude Rains and the Invisible Man. You know, it's a, it's like right, you know, the, the 1930s version. Um, so this uh, first uh, thing I'm going to do is uh, from my book titled "The Demented Chauffeur and Other Mysteries." I was challenging myself to write about crime in America here, American criminal mentality and all of its uh, disguises, and sometimes 
not too well disguised. And this is out of the uh, this is out of the confession category, and it's called act of contrition. I confess to the former mafia casinos of Cuba that Fidel Castro had his secret slot machine and lost all his money. I confess to Che Guevara betrayed like a Colombian Dillinger by the gun malls of Guatemala. I confess to Allende in Chile, murdered by CIA terrorists, and Pablo Neruda's heart was broken forever. I confess to May Clark that if Cesar Chavez had been around, your face could have been spared in me. Grapefruit humiliation and the phrase public enemy would have suddenly taken on new meaning. I confess to Lana Turner collapsing in a courtroom in 1958, the heart of her gigolo paramour punctured by a steak knife in a bedroom in Beverly Hills. I confess to Marilyn Monroe in 1962, killed according to supermarket tabloids by more murderers than any other victim in the history of the crime. I confess to John Belushi that speedballing cocaine was never tested as a salutary diet supplement. I confess to the U.S. government who continues to blast billions of dollars worth of steel into space while Native Americans starve to death in Wyoming. I confess to the raw sacrifice of seven souls exploding and flaming coins of flesh over the Florida coastline as capitalist politicians sit down to $50,000 a plate dinners in order to raise questions about the war on poverty. I confess to St. Bernadette, who in the form of Jennifer Jones married the Pasadena Art Museum, while we, children of the assassinated 1960s, tied up with construction paper, shooting nickel bags of Elmer's glue, and finally OD'd on acrylic junk. I confess to St. Teresa for letting us hitchhike to Monaco and praise to Our Lady of Yacht Harbor, who happens to be a crypt out hallucination of Grace Kelly. I confess to all my children. I confess to the young and the restless. I confess to the bold and the beautiful. I confess to the days of our lives. I confess to another world as well as to all other soap opera cancellations. I confess the sacrament of California, to God Almighty, Holy Christ, forgive America, forgive me, like so many other of the disenfranchised. I, too, am America. And uh, for my second uh, role here, um, this is from my chapbook-length selection of poems titled Nursery Rhyme Assassin. And this one is talking about the assassination of the Pacific Ocean. It's titled, The Pacific Ocean Prepares for Its Own Funeral. It's got a superscription by Henry Miller. I should read this. Um, There's really nothing wrong with life itself. We either adapt to the water or we sink to the bottom. And as humans, we have the power to pollute the ocean or destroy the spirit which animates us, Henry Miller. And here's the body copy of my poem. We live on a sandbar anchored to a view of garbage scows and schools of infestation, academic as West Coast jazz. We carry our concern, but the music is cool and carries it better. We see the harbor lights in a dark complexity of crude oil. San Onofre flies caper up like lines of conservation engineers. So all the while, nuclear protagonist killers are instigating the surcease of rejected fishes. We will go on to refuel their spawn and run in the ecological ruins. And uh, speaking of uh, 
funerals. I, I thought on the occasion of my mother's passing, I would uh, follow the writer's tradition. But I didn't want to write a, another mother death thing. And then I thought of the circumstances of it happening on Easter Sunday morning in Las Vegas, Nevada, the whole irony of that uh, sort of uh, allows me to approach it in a different way, and this is the result of that approach. Its uh, title is uh, June D. Dies, Las Vegas, Easter Sunday Morn. Early as I was prevailed upon to speak, Long before this elegy to you, measured in time, you have to remember how you heard me from my tricycle bars predict my future. Look, Ma, no plans. And remember, also, how suddenly I was out of the grades, going through the rancorous days of junior high, beginning to spy with cool particularity the years of a more academic alienation than any student in the university of life could possibly imagine. And now it is an Audubon invitation to a funeral attended only by birds who, in comparison to your wren-like disappearance, mourned a mother who at the end patiently waited for the competent Faulkner to remove her spiked hood, and feeling perhaps she had less dangerous talons. So I offer here no talisman for flight, no contrived sentiments, no grief therapy, no sympathy card hysteria, no open caskets, which would certainly be appropriate to the Easter dawn diaspora of our Irish agony. I swear you will still receive the lots of love cast at all our past ancestors in relative slumber. So wouldn't it be just like you, Junji, from this moment on to win annual Mother of the Year awards during every subsequent Lenten Sunday morning of ironic resurrection. And that's uh, actually from a book called Women Under the Influence, uh, Women Who Crossed the Path of My Life uh, Through My Life and involves uh, a lot of portraitures of uh, girl singers, of, of female actors, uh, of women on billboard signs, uh, just women who have left an indelible mark on my life. And uh, that was uh, my uh, tribute to Ma. So uh, the uh, next volume of work uh, I'm going to look at is, uh, it was published by Lawn Gnome Books in Phoenix, Arizona. It's titled... Atonal Riffs to a Tone Deaf Border Guard, which I thought was an appropriate response to all the Border Patrol activity in Arizona, throughout all the southwestern United States, really. All the pages in this book address my relationship to American contemporary music. And this the one that I've selected uh, talks about Billy Strayhorn, who collaborated with Duke Ellington on so many compositions that got into the American songbook. Do nothing till you hear from me. Don't get around much anymore. Lush life. Just about 27 other charts. And like I say, this talks about the life and death of Billy Strayhorn. Just uh, the title is just his name. So here we are. In Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, California. That's right. Los Angeles. California. And so are you. Hey, sweet pea. Tell us, did you dig it? This is where Lawrence Welk 
in a welter of ignorance, announced to his Ocean Park peer audience, Ladies and gentlemen, the boys in the band will now play Take a Train by Duke Ellington. Sweet pea, you really didn't dig it. Hey, man, don't do nothing till you hear it from me. As things get worse, the trips to Upper Manhattan Medical Group get more frequent. Sweet pea, you really didn't dig it. You paid your nurse at UMMG five yards a day to keep dumping Dewar's straight scotch into your tube feeder. All that hardcore booze churning in your arteries like 10 million choruses of lush life. When the nurse copped, your doctor stopped you from getting loaded, and it wasn't long before you just didn't get around much anymore. Sweet pea, you really didn't dig it. Today, we are still looking down into your wide-open grave, and sweet pea, you totally dug it. Just you. You with an uncorked bottle of Black Label Johnny Walker. And uh, before I, I, I get into my last blast, uh, thank you, Jack, so much for for joining me in this meeting, and uh, thank you uh, for that poetry class at UCLA in the middle 1960s for teaching all of us how poetry should sound out loud. When you would read Antonin Artaud, and William Butler Yeats, we were witnesses to the way poetry should sound. And uh, thank you, Harry, for inviting me into your poetry parlor here and, and letting other people hear that same sound. Uh, I'm going to um, move into my last blast here. And uh, it... Uh, it's from a book called War Chamber Ministry, and people have asked me why. I titled it War Chamber Ministry, and it's because I think when you think about the way world governments have worshipped war like it was a religion, and bombs and bullets have been their sacrament, uh, We've been burned uh, by more than napalm, haven't we, over the last 60 years, beginning with it, the travesty of Vietnam. So um, this afternoon, I'm going to finish with this uh, uh, poem, and I'll just do an introduction to it because it requires one. Towards the end of 2009, the Iranian people were in a state of siege. Many were very overt in their protest against insidious violation of their core freedoms by the police and the military contiguous in Iran. During a particularly intense street incident of civil unrest, one of the unarmed protesters, a young girl named Neda, was shot and killed a police sharpshooter targeted her from an overhead rooftop and blew her up. Now, in this day and age of camcorders and cell phone cameras, Neda became the martyred poster girl for the Green Revolution in Iran, with camera lenses focusing on her bleeding and dying all over the Internet. What follows here is my five-part contention meditation on the events of that day. I know what you're thinking. Five parts? We're going to be here all afternoon. Not really. The, each part is only four lines long, so it's a 20-line piece. And, uh, and thanks again for, for listening. This is titled The Sundown Sky. One. Just outside cities bordering Iranian land, we stand under the sundown sky and we experience our own stripped peelings as they flake 
in the Green Revolution of 2009. Two, the Persian Empire has been handcuffed to insurgent walls as fallen angels of freedom and firebombs contingent with gun, thunder, manufacturing explosions like strange oranges. Three, tinted streaks of martyr's blood in wide-open fascist militia street murder by rooftop ambush and no bandages to cover wounds of unarmed civilians who are human money robbed by law. Four. The hollow body stringed instruments of wisdom whine on the winds of political desolation. And during blazing storms of bloodletting, while the world waits for us to remove its fuchsia raincoat. And five. Neda wants to go home, but too late. The weathers of war warn her about malaise of hired assassins whose battering batons crack open what's left of her brothers and sisters. Iran's cold hell dawns. And uh, that about uh, finishes it for me. Michael, what I would like to say, first of all, thank you for your loving Ella Jake poem for your mom. And I always love your poems on jazz. You are such a music historian. One time I was with uh, Michael and a poet from back east, and the guy was talking about a photograph of um, some famous jazz player. And Michael corrected the guy where it took place. It was shot in Echo Park. And Michael gave him the street and the cross street, et cetera. Yeah. It was always so informative and also love it. You always stand up for peace and you're against war and standing up for the environment. But as Jennifer just indicated, just for all of us here, even though you two are such legendary poets, we would still like to know a couple of questions, a couple of answers to a couple of questions. I'll start with Michael and then I'll go to Jack. And they're just okay. two simple questions. The first one to you, Michael, when did you write your first poem? Uh, it's it's a, a kind of a funny story. Um, I, I wrote it uh, when I was about 14 in, in junior high school. Uh, uh, a, a geometry teacher uh, was uh, asked by the principal to teach an arc of poetry. And uh, she would pace up and down the aisles of the classroom, rolling her eyes and intoning uh, uh, some uh, uh, impossible diaphanous poem by Alexander Pope to the dismay of, of uh, us junior high school students in our jail cells uh, being forced to listen to this. And that from that moment on, I hated poetry. I never wanted to look at it or read it again. And uh, three years later, I met Kenneth Rex Ross, and that uh, my, everything changed. And then uh, being with Jack Hirschman uh, later on in the mid-60s uh, at UCLA, in his poetry class, Utopia. It was called Utopia because uh, uh, he, uh, of the idea that poetry is a utopian dream. And uh, Jack Hirschman was a miracle uh, and, and when it came to intoning poetry and communicating the essence of poetry. And we were so lucky as students to participate in that miracle. And um, Thanks again, Jack. I mentioned it before when I started this broadcast, but uh, wow, what a, what a, what an epiphany that was for me. Michael, and the second question to you, Michael, before I go to Jack is, what is it about the poetry? What is it about poetry that attracts you? It's uh, because it requires visionary consciousness, and it allows me to tune in uh, and become something better than myself. Well, you're pretty good as you are, and, and you always transform, you know, the, the material. 
and thank you, Michael, for I love your poetry. And and now to Jack Hirschman. The last time I saw Jack read in, uh, well, actually he read at a place that I did in uh, L.A. in late in 1987, Gasoline Alley. He came down from San Francisco to read. But before that, the last time I had seen him read was at Hoppebach Bookstore, where he read with uh, Stuart Z. Perkov in the mid to late 70s. But Jack, uh, I know this may sound somewhat elemental to you for all the writing you've done, but when, how old were you, or when did you write your first poem? Uh, my first poem was written, it was a song poem called Ring, Ring, Ring the Bells of Freedom. I sang it and recited it and sang it at the uh, block party to end the Second World War on Wheeler Avenue, now called Amadou Diallo Street, where, where, where Amadou was killed. They changed the name of the street from Wheeler Avenue in the Bronx to Amadou Diallo Street. I and my father organized the block party at the end of the Second World War in 1945. I was 12 years old. And what is it? I know you translate, you're a wonderful prose writer. What is it about poetry that attracts you to poetry? I always say it to, to a question like that. Think of the line in Sonnets to Orpheus, my favorite phrase, Gesang is Dasein. Song is existence. A poem is being. It is, it is, it is the being in every single person. And that's why I've lived my life in relation to an internationalism uh, and why I translated from nine languages. I, I must say I just translated, just came out two weeks ago, uh, the, the greatest poem of the Holocaust is called The Song of the Massacred Jewish People. And I've waited for a long time to translate it but I couldn't find the, I, it just didn't come off. And then, of course, I, when we, we were in a Holocaust ourselves, all of us, whether you're Jewish or not, that's what we're in now. And so it inspired me to translate the book. It was published by uh, Regent Press, and it's called The Song of the uh, Massacred Jewish People by Yitzhak Katzenelson, K-A-T-Z-E-N-E-L-S-O-N. He was a great writer. He was killed in Auschwitz, and he was a great poet. Uh, anyway, I just want to ask something of uh, Michael. Michael, please send me the last poem you read for oh, the sure. Building Socialism, Fighting Fascism uh, anthology that we're, we Revolutionary Poets Brigade is publishing. Oh, please are you uh, are you're orchestrating that now? Is that it? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll send it to you. Sure. It'll, it'll be out in June. Please send me that phone. I'll send it to you right away. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, and okay. thank you, Harry. Well, thank you, Michael, and thank you, Jack. And Jack, we only have a minute left, but could you yeah. tell me what the Arcanes, the title of your large volumes of poetry, specifically, what does the Arcanes mean? Arcane comes from the word arcanum, which is the secret pl the place in the Vatican that all the occult literature, dissident literature, is held. That's the word arcanum. I use it as a noun and in, in that way. Most of the people use the word arcane as an adjective. Something is mysterious, arcane. And it is. That's what it means, the uh, mysterious. In fact, I arcanized, I use that word, I invented it. <laughs> I organized the word, uh, the poem Mother, and it's called The Mother Arcane, actually. In the, it's, it's, it's in one of the arcane books. I took the poem Mother uh, and organized it and called it arcane. Well, of course, mothers are very arcane, aren't they? <laughs> but well, thank you, Jack. And I see Bob Beecher's there. Did you want to say something? Uh, Bob, okay. I will uh, get back to Jennifer and turn this over to Jennifer. And I will, I'm thrilled for your appearance today, Jack. You're an inspiration to all of us. You're, you're care for your human being. And you talked about the word utopia of your class in UCLA. 
I refer to the Motion Picture and Television Fund, my phrase for this place is socialistic utopia, because here each one of us are taken care of and we're all treated equally. And uh, thank you very much, Jack Hirschman and Michael C. Ford. And thank back you. to you, Jennifer, who makes this whole thing happen every day. Thank you. Thank it, you, Jennifer. Delightful, thank you. delightful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Jack, I just want to, before we transition to the next show, I enjoy when um, authors are able to give life to their own words. And we've had moments where those authors really um, portray, they, they really embody the poetry, almost none of them to the level that you did. I, I just wow. enjoyed being in that space that you create, not just with your words, but with your intonation, with your power. It's, um, it's lovely. And thank you, darling. I appreciate you. Yes, thank you. Michael, that's not to take anything away from you. Please don't. No, I, that, I learned everything from Jack anyway, so. So he's he's an I'll actor just, as well. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> one of my one of my teachers. I mean, I'm on I'm on the air with one of my teachers. How how cool is that? <laughs> a Fantastic. very old friend, a very old friend, Michael is. I am thrilled that this platform offers this space for you guys to reconnect in that way. Yeah, you thank made you it exist, much. Jennifer, and we thank you for that. It is my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, guys. We will see Harry back here next week, and hopefully um, Jack and Michael will be able to join us again in the near future. Okay, I know where you're at. Thank okay. you very much.